science has always groveled before the foundations of worldly life. I think on religion, on the contrary, appealed to people, saying they should observe abstinence and take care of their soul. Science taught how to experience pleasure, more and more of it. It taught people ways of widening the scope of their abilities. Religion encouraged people to refuse pleasures and to limit them. Science linked all interests to body, while religion spoke of the importance of spirit. For 15 centuries, religion in Europe had curbed human passions, thus conducing to development of spirit. For the past 500 years, it is science that has had the better of the fight, and it keeps on winning. The two opposite modes of thinking have tried to eliminate one another through many centuries. The priests have had the scientists burned at the stake. The scientists have tried to prove that religion is groundless, calling it oblivion nepenthe for people. Now the time has come for science and religion to unite so that humankind could be saved. And it is only possible for them to unite on a territory where opposites can meet. Science has always endorsed the cult of body and its needs, while religion has protected the cult of spirit. In the beginnings of Christianity, body and spirit were united within soul, where love always lives. The later Christians no longer valued faith, love, and moral virtue as the highest priorities. The soul had become stagnant, and the opposites were divided into two irreconcilable camps. Religion became aggressive, severely protecting the priority of spirit over body. Religious officials turned callous, hypocritical, and cruel. Power, status, and superiority became more important than love and virtue. The mode of thinking reverted to its former black or white state. Harmony disappeared, yielding to extremes. The concept of Christian love degenerated into formal words. Just look at the phrasing in a death sentence for a heretic. To execute without bloodshed, namely, to burn at the stake. Sooner or later, one extreme had to transform into the opposite other. The Reagan of spirit was doomed to turn into the Reagan of body. The transitional period we usually call the era of the Renaissance. I wonder, run my thoughts, when did a healthy soul stop being the highest priority? Maybe the point of this turning occurred at the earliest ecumenical councils, where the truth was selected, and thus the whole procession was a travesty of a Communist Party Congress. <laughs> or maybe this point of, is the point of Christianity becoming the official state religion. The political and economic issues have then distorted the initial view of the world given by Jesus Christ. New wine was put into old wineskins and it turned sour, and by the 14th to 15th century it had turned into vinegar. Opposites develop in struggle, thus strengthening their unity. And unity can only appear on a territory where love is present, love uniting everything in the universe since its beginning. This territory is the human soul. Love decreasing, the opposites lose their sensation of unity and begin to destroy one another while developing. First spirit wins, then body wins. Then they both perish. Suddenly a film comes to my recollection. A subtle and strikingly deep work. A film by Ingmar Bergman called Wild Strawberries. This film puts forth the issues of soul a soul dying and renascent. I suppose this can be called resurrection of soul.
An elderly doctor, respectable and renowned, leads a quiet, measured life. He is 78 years old. His medical practice has been for 50 years. His mother is still alive. She's about 95. She had 10 children, but somehow the only one still alive is her son Isaac, who has worked all his life as a doctor. He has but one son, and for some reason, no more children. The reason is not mentioned, but a peculiar sensation of an extinct kin line can be perceived. It is not only he, an elderly and age-fraught man, that is losing the sap of life. It is the whole kin that is losing the energy of life. Later on, we find out that his son does not want to have children at all. His son sees himself as dead, and he does not want to conceive dead children. But this conversation will take place later, and now the elderly doctor is preparing to be off to another city, where he is to be awarded and recognized as a merited member of society. Just on the eve of departure, he has a strange dream. He finds himself in a city where there is no life. No sounds can be heard. He lifts his eyes and sees a clock with no hands. Time has stopped. He approaches a passerby and touches his shoulder, trying to find something out. The other turns to face him, and the elderly doctor is suddenly met with a tightly shut mouth and a pair of closed eyes. Those signs on the face of a passerby mean disconnection and life at an end. Then the passerby suddenly falls down, breaking his head on the stones of the pavement. The elderly doctor looks around him in bewilderment and sees two horses pulling a hearse. All of a sudden, one of the wheels catches a lamppost and the coffin falls onto the pavement from the hearse. A hand of a dead man hangs from the coffin's side. The old man comes up to the coffin, looks inside, and at that instant the dead man grabs him by the arm and starts pulling closer. The elderly doctor awakes in horror. He cannot regain his sense of normality for a long time. He physically feels that the dream is full of meaning. He is unaware of the signs or what they stand for. The stop clock, the tightly shut eyes, and the dead man pulling him into the grave. All these are warnings meant to tell him that he is not long for this world. Soon he is going to die, in a month, or maybe in two. His subconscious informs him of that, or more precisely speaking, it gently hints of that in abstract images to make the transition into another form of life less painful. Unlike the conscious mind, the subconscious operates in images. Within an image, any quantity of information can be stored, because an image symbolizes a feeling. The notions of logic contain minimal information. They are linked to body and the conscious reasoning mind. And so the old doctor sets out, taking his son's wife with him. From conversations on the road, we can tell that the old professor, who dedicated his whole life to the medical calling, is a perfectly callous and heartless man. For all his life, health of people has been his care. But he does not want to forgive and let go of his son's big debt, despite the fact that he is not poor. He does not live by his heart or mercy and compassion. The son borrowed the money. He must give it back. It is a rule. The old professor lives by the rules and does not want to break them. However, as the film unfolds, we find out that the professor is more of a sympathetic and kind person, really. The trick is just that uh, he has been taught to live by his reason, principles and rules. First logic, then feelings. It is something in which he took after his mother. What does some illusion called soul matter when compared to will, reason, and science? The venerable professor has created a definite, detailed picture of the world 
and he behaves in accordance with it. Everything must be explained logically and sensibly. Anyone who has borrowed must give the money back. Since his very youth, the doctor has lived by his mind and not by his feelings. He has been meticulous and correct, not yielding to rushed, inconsiderate decisions. He has not allowed his feelings to undo the sobriety of his mind. And this writer agrees that passion must not be allowed to tarnish the mind and lead to lapses of reason. But the trouble is that in trying to subdue the animal feelings and passions that live deep inside our soul, we can mistakenly suppress and get rid of love along with them. The reasoning mind curbing animal desires amounts to development, whereas a mind trying to control and subdue love results in degradation of soul and gradual dying. The real picture of the universe can only be created in the soul through images and feelings linked to love. Our reason tied to the body can never reveal the true picture of the world. The more rigid and narrow the pattern of the world is created by the conscious mind, the sooner will it be destabilized and destroyed by illnesses, misfortunes, and death. <laughs> illnesses and misfortunes can be considered as a means of man's development as enlargement and testing of our informational circuit. Likewise, death can be considered as a shift to another informational pattern. The elderly professor feels the impending death. His time flow stops and starts compressing. His whole life runs in a flash before his mind's eye. He recalls his first fiance. She was in love with him but for some reason started kissing another man just before their engagement and later married that other man and yet later gave birth to six children by him. Interestingly, the professor's wife only gave him one child. It is probable that his first fiance felt that his future was failing. She might have sensed that he had no life strength enough to ensure the survival of his descendants. She felt that his correctness and logic were harmful for his soul. Heartless people cannot produce lasting progeny. The main character of the film recalls yet another scene. His wife seducing another man in adultery. Unexpectedly, her monologue is given. If my husband finds out, nothing very much will happen. The social etiquette does not allow indignant and condemning outbursts in such cases, not to mention beating up a woman. My husband will not let his feelings show. He shall calmly and coldly forgive me, and he will live on as if nothing has happened. This scene leaves a very weird impression, but intuitively we clearly understand that it is natural to have happened. When a man's soul stops working correctly and he begins living by his reason, the woman begins living by her body to counterbalance him. She starts worshipping her body and indulging it. Because marriage between man and woman means the two opposites connected and united. The woman intuitively functions as a counterweight to her spouse. Why is the old professor's name Isaac? notwithstanding the locality of his residence, which most likely is Austria or Sweden. Talented directors leave nothing to chance. The name must mean something stylistically. The first documental description of the process is given in the Bible. The process of soul growing cold and reason rising in triumph. It is the history of the Jewish people. In the epochs of constant wars, misfortunes, and tribulations, people's souls were incessantly concentrated on God, because under the conditions of continual destruction, nothing proved strong enough to cling to, except love and faith. But when the state appeared and grew strong, 
when there had been centuries of welfare and prosperity, then reason and spirit linked to well-being, culture and civilization began outshining all else. Thoughts, canons and rules became more important than feelings. Order won over chaos. And after that, the higher strategic energy gradually started diminishing. Faith turned into rituals, and observing the numerous canons was now a means to become more prosperous, rich, and well-stationed. It gradually faded from people's minds and souls that the commandments were meant to lead us to love and unite us with God. And then the state Israel was no more. The Jewish people was dispersed about the whole world. And it was only the continual humiliations and calamities that saved it from total annihilation. And, of course, faith saved it in no less a degree, for it only started reviving in those same calamities. The film Wild Strawberries was released in 1957. The sexual revolution was yet to be heard of, the moral dissolution and the dispassionate frigidity of soul were yet to come. But the great prophetic artist had intuited the trends growing in his Europe. The coldness of soul described in the Bible became a reality in Europe, following the implacable laws of cause and effect. Let the dead bury their dead, Christ once said. A person whose soul has stopped functioning properly is dead, even though they themselves might not be aware of it. The body may be healthy and full of energy, the mind may be clear and vast, but on subtle plane the person is no more. They have no future, and their descendants are also divine.